Well, thank you, Mr. President, for joining us here at the Defense Media Activity. It is very exciting for us to have you here for a face-to-face uh, -face conversation with U.S. service members. We're very, very pleased to have you. Well, uh, Nathan, thank you so much for uh, your participation. I want to thank uh, everybody who's here uh, in Fort Meade. There are a couple of people I want to acknowledge. Uh, first of all, uh, your garrison commander, uh, Colonel Brian Foley. Where is he? I just rode over with him. There he is. The, uh, he's in charge of a lot of stuff. I was uh, he, uh, with, with everything that's going on uh, out of this uh, incredible facility. Uh, obviously, we can't succeed in our missions without uh, a strong support from Congress. And uh, we've got a congressman here who uh, works very hard on behalf of our military and our intelligence, uh, Congressman Dutch uh, Ruppesberger. Where's uh, Dutch? There he is. Thank you so much, Dutch. Uh, I'm going to be very brief at the front because I want to mainly take questions from folks not just here but uh, all, all around the world. Um, you know, today's a solemn day. Uh, I started my day uh, commemorating 9-11. Uh, and all the people who uh, were killed on that day. And, you know, I've had an opportunity as president to meet with many of the survivors, uh, the family members of those who were killed. And, you know, on, on this particular day, we are constantly reminded uh, of uh, their loss. We want to let them know that we do not forget those who were fallen. Uh, we are inspired by the survivors, uh, many of whom still have uh, the scars, both seen and unseen, uh, of that terrible, terrible day. Uh, and it's also a good time to remember uh, all the people who have served and sacrificed since 9-11 in order to keep America safe and free. Uh, you know, we have uh, veterans now from uh, every state in the Union uh, who have served uh, oftentimes in multiple tours, both in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and although we have made enormous strides in degrading uh, the core al-Qaeda, uh, including bin Laden himself, uh, that had helped to direct the plot on 9-11, uh, we are well aware of the fact that those threats uh, still exist out there. And here at Fort Meade, we do some of the most important work uh, in helping to coordinate our efforts to make sure that uh, we are bringing to bear all elements of American power uh, against those who would try to do us harm here in the homeland or overseas uh, or would threaten our allies. Uh, despite the progress we've made in Afghanistan, it's still critically important that we've got uh, thousands of, of trainers and advisors who are supporting the Afghan uh, military efforts there. Uh, our combat role is complete, but we still have to make sure that uh, they are getting the kind of help and assistance that they need. Uh, the emergence of ISIL uh, in Iraq and Syria uh, has meant that we have to be present and we are pounding them uh, every single day. Uh, our airmen are doing extraordinary work uh, with the support of all the other service branches, uh, and we're providing training uh, and assistance and support to uh, the Iraqi security forces on the ground uh, as they continue to push back ISIL from territory that they had taken. Uh, but you know, both in Iraq and in Syria, in Afghanistan, in North Africa, uh, what we're very clear about is, is that we still have significant threats. Uh, coming from terrorist organizations and a terrorist ideology. We also have the traditional threats that our military has to be prepared for, uh, and from uh, you know, a new Pacific region uh, where uh, historically we have underwritten the security and prosperity of a region that uh, came back after World War II uh, and where we have uh, tremendous alliances uh, to Europe. Uh, and our role as the cornerstone of NATO. Uh, and so we are going to continually have to uh, you know, work at every level to make sure that uh, our men and women in uniform are provided the strategy they need to succeed, the resources they need to succeed, the equipment, the training. And in this new era, uh, that's not just a matter of tanks and rifles. It's, 
uh, as everybody I think here is aware, especially here at Fort Meade, uh, cybersecurity is opening up a whole new era uh, in which we have to watch out for our adversaries. So, you know, on 9-11, uh, I thought it was particularly appropriate for me to be able to uh, address you directly and to say thank you on behalf of the American people. Uh, you know, when I look out uh, in this audience and when I think about uh, all the members of the armed services all around the world who serve. Uh, this represents America. You know, uh, you've got people of every race, religion, faith, um, every region of the country, uh, but what we share is a common creed, uh, a common commitment to freedom, a common commitment to rule of law, a common belief uh, that America uh, is an indispensable uh, force for good around the world uh, and that uh, our military uh, is a linchpin uh, in our ability to project uh, our values uh, alongside our diplomatic efforts, our economy, uh, and uh, the people-people relations that uh, help to spread uh, uh, those core beliefs that uh, all of you are willing to sacrifice for. So I want to say thank you to you. I want to especially say thank you to those who are uh, serving overseas and who are watching here today because uh, many of them are uh, away from family right now. Uh, we are uh, grateful for your service. Uh, I don't have a greater honor than serving as your Commander-in-Chief. Uh, and every single day I see the extraordinary work that you do and I benefit from it as well. So with that, why don't we start taking some questions. Yes, of course, sir. As you mentioned, we do have family members and service members worldwide watching this Worldwide Troop Talk through American Forces Network and on ships at sea. We're going to go out there in a little bit, but the first question we do want to be represented from one of the many service members we have here. So the first question will go out to the audience if, uh, if someone has one ready. So we have Sergeant Carnath coming down with the microphone for you here, Sergeant Harvey. Good morning, Mr. President. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Sergeant Brianna Harvey. I'm from Texas, and my question is, what made you initiate MBK on the 27th of February in 20, 2020, 2014, and will you create something similar for females, and what will you miss the most once you're no longer president and out of the Oval Office? Well, those are great questions. What part of Texas are you from? Harker Heights, Texas. Harker Heights, Texas. Yes, Mr. President. Well, tell everybody back home I said hi. <laughs> yes, um, sir. <laughs> for, for service members who aren't aware, uh, uh, what we're referring to when we talk about MBK is uh, what we call my brother's keeper. Uh, the, one of the most important principles I think of America is, is that no matter who you are, no matter what you look like, uh, if you work hard, you can get ahead. And you know, there are pockets of poverty in places where people uh, don't have an opportunity. And that's particularly true uh, among uh, young men uh, who uh, too often are ending up in prison instead of going to school or serving our military. And so what we've been trying to do is to set up mentorship programs, make sure that they're aware of what's going on, provide them with job training. Uh, I had uh, a meeting with some folks in New Orleans, uh, young men who uh, just come from terrible circumstances, terrible neighborhoods. And we want to make sure that they are aware of uh, how they can break the cycle and uh, do right by themselves and ultimately uh, do right by their families. And one of the young men who was sitting next to me uh, uh, was interested in enrolling in, uh, in the Marines, but he was worried that uh, uh, he had heard a rumor that he might not be able to serve in the Marines if he had tattoos. I said, I, I don't think, uh, I've met a lot of Marines, I don't think that's going to be a problem. <laughs> so we're, uh, so, but, but it gives you a sense of some young, young people are so out of the loop and, and have so little exposure that they don't know where to go and, and, and uh, how to, uh, how to you know, apply themselves in ways that allow them to succeed. So uh, we are working diligently on that, not just ourselves, but businesses and uh, our military leaders are hel helping out on this issue. Um, young women, uh, we have a whole nother set of initiatives in the White House called, uh, we have a White House Council on Women and Girls uh, to provide opportunity for them as well. I have to say generally, uh, the young women are doing better than the young men. Uh, that's because you guys are a little smarter. Um, but, uh, but obviously they need opportunities as well. In terms of what I'm gonna miss, 
the most. Uh, you know, I, I, I meant what I said. That the greatest privilege I have is serving uh, as your commander in chief. Uh, when I travel around the world, every place I go, I see folks who are doing incredible work. Uh, and it's not uh, typically fighting. Uh, a lot of times it's helping train other countries uh, so that they can secure themselves. A lot of times it's helping on engineering projects or development projects or uh, helping people uh, after a natural disaster. Uh, you are ambassadors and spread goodwill uh, around the world uh, every single day uh, at enormous sacrifice uh, to yourselves. And, and so I'll, I'll miss that a lot. Uh, you know, the plane's nice too. Uh, <laughs> uh, I got to admit, but uh, my lease is running out. So the, uh, I'm hoping that I'm not going to have to start taking off my shoes again uh, going, through, uh, going through security. <laughs> what I won't miss is the fact that I can, uh, I live in what's called the bubble, right? So they don't let me uh, go anywhere. You know, so if I just want to go take a walk, you know, uh, I got to have helicopters and boats and all that stuff. And, you know, even when I cross the Potomac, they've got, you know, everybody in position. Um, and I, I can't just, on a Saturday morning, uh, you know, go down to Starbucks or something, not shave. You know, it sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> you know. So those are some of the things I'll be doing when I get out of here. <laughs> and I probably won't wear a tie for at least a month. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Sergeant Harvey, for that question. I promised we were going to go worldwide, sir, mm -hmm. and we are. Your first question from overseas is a place that you are familiar with. You've traveled there a few times, and I'm sure our service members are familiar with it as well. Our first question is going to come from downrange, and Petty Officer Lori Bent is going to take us there. Mr. President, we have your first live satellite question from Afghanistan. We have S Sergeant Aaron Giese. Sergeant Giese, if you can hear me, go ahead and nod. You are on the live with the pre on the line with the president. Go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Uh, my name is Sergeant Aaron Giese, and I first want to take uh, time to thank you for the opportunity to speak with me today. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, my question for you is, due to the recent Russian activity in Syria and the possibility of future activity, what, how will that affect our current military strategy within the region? Well, it's a, it's a great question, Aaron. First of all, let me just say thank you uh, for your service and, and please tell everybody uh, in your unit uh, that we appreciate them as well, uh, that we're thinking about them and you're in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, as I indicated in my opening remarks, we've done an, uh, an incredible job in going after and systematically dismantling uh, the core Al-Qaeda network that was operating primarily in the Fatah region between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, they still pose a threat, but it is much diminished. Uh, but what's happened with uh, this radical, violent extremism is that it's metastasized and it's spread to other areas. And uh, you know, right now, ground zero for those activities is in Syria uh, with ISIL. And uh, our strategy has consistently been that we will use our air power to support efforts by uh, Iraqi security forces on the ground and where we can find it, moderate opposition inside of Syria, uh, to push back on ISIL, to put pressure on them, to go after their financing, to go after their networks, uh, uh, their supplies. Uh, a lot of them, uh, uh, a lot of their operations are funded by oil sales, and so blocking those, uh, going after the infrastructure that they've built up. Those strategies will all continue. Uh, the challenge we've had in Syria is that uh, the president there, uh, Bashir al-Assad, has been so destructive towards his own people, uh, destroying entire cities, dropping bombs, 
uh, creating a, a sectarian conflict uh, between Shia and Sunni inside of Syria, that uh, it has become a magnet for jihadists throughout the region. And the good news is, is that Russia shares with us a concern about countering uh, violent extremism and shares with us the view that ISIL is very dangerous. Uh, so despite our conflicts with Russia in areas like Ukraine, this is an area potentially of converging interests. The bad news is that Russia continues to believe that Assad, who is their traditional partner, is somebody that is worthy of continuing support. And it has been my view and the view of the United States government that as long as Assad is there, he has alienated so much of the Syrian population that it will not be possible to arrive at a peaceful ceasefire and political settlement. And you'll continue to have this vacuum that's filled by extremists. So uh, Russia has, for many years now, provided financial support, sold arms to Assad. Uh, I remember a conversation I had with uh, Mr. Putin four or five years ago where I told him that was a mistake, it would make things worse as long as he continued to support Assad. Uh, he uh, did not uh, take my warnings, and as a consequence, things have gotten worse. It appears now that Assad is worried enough that he's inviting Russian advisors in uh, and Russian equipment in. And that won't change our core strategy, which is to continue to put pressure on ISIL in Iraq and Syria. But uh, we are going to be engaging Russia to let them know that you can't continue to double down on a strategy that's doomed to failure. And that if they are willing to work with us and the, the 60 nation coalition that we've put together, then there's the possibility of a political settlement in which Assad would be transitioned out and uh, a new uh, coalition of moderate, uh, secular, uh, and inclusive uh, forces uh, could come together to restore order in the country. That's our goal. Uh, we'll, you know, this is going to be a, a long uh, discussion that uh, we'll be having with the Russians, but it is not going to prevent us from continuing to go after uh, ISIL very hard. It could prevent us from arriving at the political settlement that ultimately is needed to bring a peace uh, back to Syria. Uh, and you know, uh, this is where our military efforts have to be combined with effective uh, diplomatic efforts. One of the things that I've said to uh, all of our men and women in uniform is that you shouldn't be fighting for our security and our freedom alone. Uh, you've got to have the support of diplomats and intelligence experts and others uh, because although you are vital and necessary, if you're doing it by yourselves, uh, we can win any battle. But you know, our main challenge right now in a lot of these countries like Syria and Afghanistan and Libya and North Africa is disorder. And the only way you restore order, uh, unless you're occupying every country that starts breaking down is through political negotiations and settlement, and that's, uh, that's where the Russians uh, are, are going to have to start uh, uh, getting a little smarter uh, than they have been, because they are threatened in many ways uh, more than we are by ISIL. Uh, you know, they've got large Muslim populations that historically uh, have uh, caused a lot of problems inside of Russia. And, and the strategy that uh, they're pursuing right now, doubling down on Assad, I think is a big mistake. Well, Thars, thank you, Sergeant Giese, for that question from Afghanistan. We here at the Defense Media Activity do hope that you and others downrange do stay safe. We do have thousands of members overseas watching the American Forces Network or they're streaming live on defense.gov, and they too are eager to talk to you, Mr. President, and they can through social media. In fact, Petty Officer Lori Bent's going to take us out there now. Well, our next question is going to come from Twitter. Sir, we have a question from jrita2192. Mr. President, can you share with us your personal experience and memories of when 9-11 first happened? It was interesting. Uh, 
Michelle and I were just talking about that uh, this morning. Um, Sasha, my youngest daughter, uh, had just been born. She was four or five months old. Um, and uh, September 11th uh, was Malia's first day of preschool or kindergarten. I think it was kindergarten. So Michelle had gone with the girls uh, to drop uh, Malia off at school. They were tiny. Uh, I was at the time a state senator, so I was going to uh, uh, downtown Chicago to, uh, to a hearing uh, on an issue. And uh, I remember driving uh, on Lakeshore Drive in Chicago and, and hearing the reports of a plane crashing uh, into the buildings. And uh, at first, the reports were unclear, so you thought it was a Cessna or some accident had happened. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, I got downtown uh, to where the hearing was taking place that uh, we started realizing it was something much more serious. Uh, and at, at that time, no one was sure uh, whether this was uh, a one-off or whether this was going to be an ongoing attack because then you started getting reports from the Pentagon uh, and other places. And so the building was evacuated, and I remember standing uh, downtown Chicago uh, with thousands of other people. Uh, you know, and there were a lot of targets, obviously, for possible action, uh, this including at the time it was called the Sears Tower. And, and people uh, uh, didn't know what to think. And then I remember going to my law office and. And that's when we saw the images of uh, the Twin Towers starting to come down. And uh, that evening, uh, I have very vivid memories of, uh, of you know, giving Sasha a bottle and rocking her to sleep while we were watching uh, uh, you know, the aftermath of, of those attacks. And like I think everybody here, uh, you know, e although most of you were a lot younger, uh, you know, it, it, it gave you a sense for the first time in my lifetime uh, that our homeland could be vulnerable uh, in that way. Uh, we hadn't seen an attack like that since Pearl Harbor. And uh, I think it inspired all of us uh, to remember just how precious what we have is uh, and the need for us to defend it uh, at any cost. And, uh, you know, although subsequently I would have um, you know, strong disagreements with the previous administration about certain decisions that were made, um, uh, I remember and uh, give great credit to President Bush for uh, uh, being at the site, uh, throwing out that first pitch at, at uh, Yankee Stadium, and uh, everyone remembering that you know, you're not a Democrat first or a Republican first or a uh, you know, Texan first or a Californian first. Uh, you, you know, you're an American. And that uh, we all had to come together. And my hope is always on a day like today that we remember uh, that sense that uh, what binds us together is much more important than which, uh, anything that divides us. Uh, and that uh, what makes this country special is the fact that um, you know, we, we are bound together. We, we, we are our parents or our great-grandparents. We all come from different places. Uh, but we all have a shared creed, uh, a, a shared belief system, uh, and a shared set of commitments. And. Uh, uh, you know, all of you uh, in your service exemplify that every day. It's an excellent question from social media, and our viewers can join us and join this conversation on social media from Twitter using the hashtag AskPOTUS or to the Department of Defense's Facebook page. We're actually going to go back overseas for you, Mr. President, and Petty Officer Lori Bent is going to take us there. Sir, we are headed to NATO, Brussels, Belgium, where we're going to talk to Navy Commander Scott Cregan. Commander Cregan, go ahead with your question for the president. Commander 
Thank you for your time, Mr. President. I was honored to march in your inaugural parade in 2009, and we briefly met a few years later when I worked at a Halloween White House event. I was a Star Wars stormtrooper. You were you great. You may not remember what I looked like, because uh, we all kind of looked alike. Uh, on a serious note, we're seeing more and more refugees coming to Europe by land and by sea. Do you think there should be a NATO response to this crisis? Uh, I think that we have to work with our European partners uh, on this issue. Uh, you know, the, the refugee crisis is not uh, just a, a European problem, uh, it's a world problem, and we have obligations. I made uh, certain to, to send through every agency that we've got to do our part, first of all, in taking our share of refugees. And those of you who saw some of these heartbreaking images of uh, that small boy uh, drowned. I think uh, anybody who's a parent uh, understands uh, that um, you know that that stirs all of our consciences, uh, not just uh, uh, you know folks uh, on the other side of the Atlantic. So uh, I've already been in discussions with uh, people like Prime Minister uh, uh, Renzi of Italy, uh, the Greeks, and others who are. Uh, down south about how uh, we can enhance uh, maritime efforts to make sure, first of all, that people who are loading up on these rickety boats uh, are uh, safe and we're not seeing enormous loss of life uh, there. Uh, we are encouraged by uh, the efforts of the uh, European Union to accept uh, refugees in all countries and, and, and spread out uh, some of the burdens and the pressure. Uh, and as I said, I, the United States needs to do our share. I said that uh, we should establish a floor of at least 10,000 uh, refugees that we're willing to accept uh, and cut through some of the bureaucracy and red tape to do that. Uh, ultimately though, uh, as you well know, it is really important for us to go to the source. You know, there's the old story about if you see a bunch of bodies uh, floating down a river, uh, part of your job is to uh, pull those folks out and save who you can, but you also got to go downstream and see what exactly is happening. And this refugee crisis is prompted by uh, the collapse of governance in Syria uh, and uh, the growth of ISIL and the cruelty that Assad is perpetrating on his own people. Uh, and that's why the response I gave earlier, uh, the importance of us continuing our uh, military efforts against ISIL, but also trying to pull together a strong international diplomatic effort uh, to bring about some sort of political accord inside of Syria is going to be so important and so vital. Uh, last point I'll make about this, though, and this is where NATO planning becomes critical, even as we're in the short term uh, helping countries respond to the immediate crisis. Uh, unfortunately, we can anticipate that uh, refugees will be an ongoing problem for decades to come. And the reason is because uh, uh, there are too many states that are not doing well by their people. Uh, the spread of media gives people in war-torn countries or in extreme poverty a vision of a better life, and they are desperate and willing to take extraordinary risks to get there. You then have uh, you know, other factors that, are, that may end up uh, resulting in more migration and refugees. For example, climate change. I just came back from Alaska where you're seeing glaciers melt rapidly, and as temperatures rise, uh, you know, the Pentagon's own assessment is that this will end up being a national security challenge in part because uh, people will be displaced from their traditional lands either by drought or by flooding and that can create more refugee problems. So we're going to have to work globally and one of the topics I'm sure when I go to the United Nations General Assembly uh, leaders gathering that we typically have at the end of this month uh, is to start coming up with a more effective structure uh, for an international response. Uh, no one country can
can solve these problems alone. Uh, but the United States, obviously, is the world's leader, uh, and NATO, as the premier alliance in the world, is going to have to play a central role. We want to thank the Lieutenant Commander for that question. Mr. President, we've been to Europe, to Afghanistan. We've gone online. So I think it's time we come back to the studio here Let's at do it. Defense Media Activity for a question. And we'll have one of our mic people. Looks so like we have a question up front. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. President. C SAN 1, Rick Rickle from Arizona. Uh, you alluded to in your opening remarks uh, the threat that cyber currently is. Uh, and there's been a lot of talk within the DOD and the cyber community about uh, possibility of a, a separate of the military dedicated to cyber, but I was wondering what, where you see cyber in the next five to ten years. Well, it's a great question. Uh, the, uh, you know, we initiated Cyber Command anticipating that this is going to be, uh, you know, a new theater for potential conflict. And, you know, what we've seen uh, by both state and non-state actors is the increasing sophistication of hacking, uh, the ability to penetrate uh, systems that uh, we previously thought would be secure, and it is moving fast. So offense is moving a lot faster than defense. Now, part of this has to do with the way the Internet, the internet was originally designed. It, it was not designed uh, with the expectation that there would end up being three or four or five billion people uh, doing commercial transactions, et cetera. It was, thought this was just going to be an academic uh, you know, network to, to share papers and formulas and whatnot. Uh, and so the, the, the architecture of the Internet uh, makes it very difficult to defend consistently. We continue to be uh, the best in the world at uh, understanding and uh, working within uh, cyber, but other countries have caught up. Uh, the Russians are good, the Chinese are good, the Iranians are good, and you've got non-state actors, hackers, who are excellent. Uh, and, you know, unlike traditional uh, conflicts and aggression, uh, oftentimes we don't have a return address if somebody hacks into a system and uh, goes after uh, critical infrastructure, for example. Uh, or penetrates our financial systems. Uh, you know, we can't necessarily trace it directly to that state or that actor. That makes it more difficult as well. So uh, what we've done is to try to emphasize, number one, uh, the need for a coordinated response. And uh, over the last several years, what we've done is to bring together our military agencies, Cyber Command, with uh, the NSA, with uh, our intelligence, uh, and working with the private sector uh, to try to strengthen our defenses m much better. Uh, and uh, we've made progress, but we're not making enough progress. Uh, so I would anticipate that we are going to have to do more, uh, both through the Defense Department, but again, we're going to have to work because this is an, an, not a traditional war theater. We're going to have to work with uh, a whole bunch of other actors and coordinate with them uh, much more effectively. Uh, the bulk of uh, vulnerable information and data isn't in our military. It's in the private sector. Uh, it's throughout our economy. Uh, it's on your smartphones. And so uh, we're going to have to uh, both strengthen overall networks, but we're also going to have to train uh, millions of individual actors, small businesses, big vendors, individuals in terms of basic uh, uh, you know, cyber hygiene. Uh, we're going to have to be much more rapid in responding to attacks. Uh, and uh, this is something that we're just at the infancy of. Ultimately, one of the solutions we're going to have to come up with is to uh, craft agreements among at least state actors about what's acceptable and what's not. And so, for example, uh, I'm going to be getting a visit from uh, President Xi of China, uh, a state visit here coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, we've made very clear to the Chinese uh, that uh, there are certain practices that they're engaging in uh, 
that we know are emanating from China and are not acceptable. And, you know, we, we can choose to make this an area of competition, uh, which I guarantee you we'll win if we have to, uh, or alternatively we can come to an agreement in which we say this isn't helping anybody. Let's instead try to have some basic rules of the road in terms of how we, uh, how we operate. Now, as I said, there's still going to be individual actors. There are going to be terrorist networks and others. So we're still going to have to build a strong defense. Uh, but uh, one of our first uh, and most important uh, uh, efforts has to be to get the states that may be sponsoring cyber attacks uh, to, uh, to understand that uh, you know, there comes a point at which we consider this a, a core national security threat and we will treat it as such. Okay. The next excellent Thank you. question from one of our cyber warriors here at Fort Meade, Maryland. He looks like he knows what he's doing. <laughs> well, we are here on the East Coast, but I hear Petty Officer Lori Bent wants to take us all the way to the West Coast for your next question. Yes, our next question comes from Joint Base Lois McCord from a C-17 instructor pilot, Major Jennifer Moore. Major Moore, go ahead with your question. Mr. President, good afternoon. Sir, both my husband and I have been serving side by side as C-17 and T-6 instructor pilots for the past 11 years, and we have two amazing and thriving children. How do you and Mrs. Obama know how to balance life and work to ensure your children will grow up to be successful in their future endeavors? Well, first of all, uh, thanks to you and your husband both for serving. Uh, and tell your kids I said hi. Uh, and that they should do what you tell them to do. Uh, uh, how, how old are your kids? Well, my daughter Gabby is seven and my son Robert is four. I have a picture, sir. Show, they would kill hold me up if the I picture. Didn't have an opportunity to show you. Oh, that's a good looking crew right there. They're adorable. Absolutely. The yeah. happiest place on earth. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, I'll, I'll give you, uh, uh, you know, the best advice uh, that, that I probably can offer is, for me at least, I just do what Michelle tells me to do and it seems to work <laughs> out. Um, and, and your husband may take the same approach. Uh, and, and those are great ages, you know, seven, four, you know, because they, you come home and they're jumping on you and so excited to see you. And, uh, when they get to be 17 and 14, then uh, they still love you, but th you're not very interesting. <laughs> uh, but, y y you know, uh, er everybody here, you know, the demands of your jobs are so extraordinary, and it it's not like you're always on the clock. Uh, you know, you just got to get the job done. Uh, and, and that puts a lot of pressure uh, on folks. You know, one thing I know we can do is make sure that our military is supporting families. Uh, and that means making sure that housing and uh, child care, you know, all the things that go into supporting families uh, when they're stationed, particularly given how much they're moving, uh, becomes absolutely critical. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, Michelle has worked with Dr. Jill Biden uh, on joining forces to make sure that we are spending a lot of time thinking about how are we supporting military families on an ongoing basis, uh, including those spouses who are not in service, but who are serving uh, alongside uh, and, and you know, do so much uh, critical work, making sure that they have the opportunity, for example, to find a job if they're getting transferred uh, and, and uh, have the kind of uh, backing uh, that they need. So that's really important. You shouldn't have to do this alone. Um, what Michelle and I did with Malia and Sasha, I think early on is we just, we're, we're a strong believer in uh, structure and rules and uh, unconditional love, but, you know, uh, you know being pretty firm too. Um, you know, we started real early, you know, here's your bedtime, 
here's when you're not watching TV. You'll sit there and eat your vegetables, even if we have to sit there with you, watch you, chew for 10 minutes, uh, and we're going to watch you swallow. And, you know, if you start early enough with just high expectations, uh, uh, I, you know, I think kids do well with that. Um, and, uh, you know, part of that involves, you know, just loving those kids to death, but also letting them know, you know what, I'm your parent, I'm not your best friend. So, uh, I'm not that interested in what your friends are doing. Uh, you know, that, that's, you know, they've got parents, their parents can make a decision. This is what you're doing in our house. Uh, and when you leave here, you'll be able to make your own decisions. But we're trying to prepare you so that you've got some sense when you get out of here. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I think that's worked. I think that's, uh, that's been appreciated. Sometimes they complain. They say, well, how come, you know, so-and-so is able to stay out until whatever hour? It's like, well, you know, uh, that's not really our problem, is it? And, uh, and, and I, I, you know, uh, they're, they're getting old enough now where sometimes they, uh, they appreciate it. Mainly because they also know that we just, uh, you know, we, we adore them. Uh, and uh, last thing, I guess, is just uh, as much as possible, we try to make sure every night when we're home that uh, they have to sit down and eat dinner with us. You know, I'm a big believer in, you know, not getting the TV trays out and watching the Kardashians. Uh, you know, you sit down, leave your cell phone somewhere else, and we'll have a conversation, you know, and, uh, and that seems to help, too. All right? So that, that's all by, by, by the way, uh, me just channeling Michelle. Like I said, the main <laughs> thing for your husband to do is just listen to you. That was an excellent question, and I know my <laughs> wife, Jazzy, would agree. Uh, I listened to her I'll call day in that, day sir. Out. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, and I know I'm sure all of our service members who have families would agree a large part of why we do what we do and how we can do what we do is those loved ones we have at home. So Absolutely. I'm sure we all appreciate uh, our family members there. Yeah. So we do have family members watching on the American Forces Network. I know my wife, she's watching on defense.gov right now with my two-year-old son. And uh, they have an opportunity to talk to you as well through social media. Excellent. And we're going to take, Patty Officer Lori Bent is going to take us there now. We are headed online to Facebook. Sir, this question is coming from Michael Ong. Mr. President, how do you keep striving for great accomplishments with a positive <laughs> attitude while everyone seems to be hating and talking smack about you and yeah. all you do? <laughs> you know, uh, the truth is, is that not everyone's talking smack about me. Uh, but there is a sizable percentage in Congress that talks smack <laughs> about me, no doubt about it. You, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, when you go into public service, um, I think there are two ways to approach it. Uh, one way to approach it is that you just want to be popular. You want to get elected, you want to stay in office, you want to be popular. Uh, another way of approaching it is uh, I want a particular position because I want to get something done for the American people. And not everything that is right to do is going to be the popular thing to do. And you know, I made a decision early on that if I was going to do this, if I was going to run for elected office, that I had to have some core, some set of beliefs and principles, and that, you know, there would be times where I made mistakes or I made a wrong call, but that I was guided by what I thought was best for the American people. And that I couldn't worry about short-term popularity if I was going to do my best. So, yeah, I'll give you a good example. 
when I came into the office early on, uh, you know, we had the worst financial crisis in our history. Uh, one of the casualties of that was the U.S. auto industry. Um, the big three automakers were on the verge of flatlining and were getting all these bailouts, but they weren't changing what they were doing. And a lot of folks thought that Chrysler was going to go bankrupt and then GM was going to go next and, you know, then all the suppliers would lose out and pretty soon all we would be able to buy is Japanese and Korean and German cars. And I said, uh, uh, you know, this is an industry that's too important, one that we essentially built for us to be able to just let it go. And I knew that we had to put more money into it to get it, the industry back on its feet, but I also knew that we had to force them to make management changes so they could start building good cars and competing again. Well, I tell you, when, when we put forward our plan, uh, I think that 10% of people agreed with it. Even in, even in Michigan, I think the overwhelming majority of people opposed it opposed our plan. Uh, and if I had been thinking in terms of just looking at the poll numbers, I wouldn't have done it. But I looked at the evidence and what I thought was going to be best, and we did it. Uh, and this year, we're probably going to sell more U.S. cars than we have in 20 years, and they've hired back hundreds of thousands of workers, uh, and it's been driving uh, a rebound of American manufacturing that is vital to our economy. So, you know, the, the longer I'm in this office, the more committed I am to uh, making those calls. Uh, you know, when we, and, and, and part of the challenge in this job is, is that if it's an easy question, it doesn't get to my desk. The only things that come to my desk are things that somebody else hadn't been able to solve. And my job is to make a decision based on sometimes imperfect information and you're working on the percentages. When, when, when I made the order for us to go in and get bin Laden at uh, uh, you know, that house in, uh, in Pakistan, it was probably a 50-50 proposition as to whether that was in fact him. Uh, and the risks obviously were enormous. If I had been making that decision based on wanting to avoid risk and not having somebody talk smack about me, uh, then that might not be a decision that I, was, uh, I would have been prepared to make. Uh, so, um, so, so I, I tend, and, and part of this is, is, is my own personal faith uh, and prayer, and, and part of it is uh, the support of uh, an incredible family uh, and friends, uh, and part of it is, you know, seeing the sacrifices that all of you make. Uh, you know, when I go to Walter Reed and I visit wounded troops, uh, then I say to myself, well, I, I, I've got to be serious about what I do. And I can't be worrying about poll numbers or what cable TV says. I've got to make sure that I am, uh, to the best of my abilities, making the decisions that I think are going to be most important for American prosperity and American security over the long term. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, that way you can at least sleep at night. You know, uh, that, that way when I go to bed, I, I, I go to bed easy uh, I, I, because I know that I've made the best decisions I could make. Now, the only way that works is if I'm also open and listening to see if the decisions I made were the right ones. Is it working? And I've got to be open to the fact that sometimes I may not make the right decision and I'm willing to correct it. Um, and I've got to own that. And, and that's what I always tell everybody in the White House is if somebody screws up, because there will be some screw ups, own it and correct it and learn from it. Uh, and, and what applies to everybody on my team applies uh, to me as well. So uh, you'll, I think some of you may recall when we uh, uh, past health care, uh, everything was working fine until there was this website that didn't work. It was a disaster. 
Uh, even though I've been asking every two weeks, how's the website going? I hope this works. Uh, but it didn't work. And we had to own that and double down, and, and we corrected it in uh, three or four months, and now 16 million people have health insurance that didn't have it before, and it's actually cost less than people anticipated. It's working the way it should have, but, you know, uh, that, that was a screw-up. Um, and, and there's no point in trying to hide things when they don't work. Um, so um, I guess the last thing I'd say is I tend to just take the long view on things. I, um, you know, political polls and, you know, what the pundits say and uh, what other politicians say, that, that comes and goes. It goes up and goes down. Um, you know, I try to think 20 years from now when I look back, will people say, uh, this person operated with integrity and made decisions uh, that were best for the country. And, if, you know, so far that's working for me anyway. Doesn't mean I'm not sometimes a little offended. <laughs> that's when I go to the gym. <laughs> Work it off. Right. Well, Mr. President, your next question, Petty Officer Lori Bin is going to take us overseas. Thanks. Sir, your next question is coming from Gunnery Sergeant Bryson Elliott, and he's at U.S. AFRICOM, Stuttgart, Germany. Gunny, go ahead with your question. First of all, sir, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking my question. Mr. President, my question is how are military, how are military exercises like African Lion with Morocco strengthening the relationships between the U.S. and African nations? Well, it's a great question, and uh, thank you for your service. Tell everybody at AFRICOM we appreciate them. Um, you know, I just came back from Africa uh, several months ago, uh, and there are huge challenges there, but also huge opportunities. Uh, first of all, that's a continent that appreciates America. You know, when you look at polls, the continent as a whole, their positive views of America are, are as high as any other continent in the world. Uh, you know, so uh, the people of the African continent admire the United States. They appreciate uh, our values and our way of life. Uh, and you know, there's, there's a real connection. It also is the continent with some of the fastest growing economies in the world. I think we tend to uh, have stereotypes about Africa as, you know, Ebola and poverty and all this stuff. Uh, you, when you travel there, uh, they're moving. And you know, you, you go to cities there and everybody's got a cell phone and everybody's hustling and everybody's working. And uh, you know, that's gonna be a, one of the great uh, next arenas for economic growth and trade. And that means that the United States is selling more goods there and, uh, they're selling more here, and uh, you know, there are enormous opportunities. So our prosperity uh, with them is tied together. What is also true is, is that there are parts of Africa, particularly North Africa, uh, but it's seeping down along the coasts, uh, where uh, violent uh, Islamic extremism has taken, taken hold. And Somalia being a prime example, where Al-Shabaab's been working for a long time, Boko Haram in Nigeria, uh, uh, Al Qaeda in the Maghreb. And so we have to have a strategy to partner with those countries uh, to, to ensure that uh, our intelligence capabilities, our rapid response capabilities, and uh, their own capabilities for maintaining order and pushing back against. Uh, extremism, uh, that they are a lot stronger uh, in the years to come. The good news is that these countries are eager for that kind of cooperation. Countries like Nigeria, countries like Kenya, uh, welcome our presence, welcome our training of their uh, troops. Uh, we have excellent uh, CT cooperation with them. Uh, the big problem they've got is capacity. Uh, but capacity is one of those things you can solve where you've got a willing partner. Uh, so, you know, we're working uh, with the Joint Chiefs to develop plans so that we are continuing to build up partnership capabilities 
uh, across the continent. And that will help us uh, not only uh, with homegrown problems inside of Africa, but those platforms then also allow us to uh, act more effectively against uh, deeply rooted organizations like Al-Qaeda uh, uh, on the peninsula uh, in Yemen, uh, because that's right across the ocean. Uh, and uh, we want to be able to sh make sure that we can target those terrorist networks uh, effectively. Having African partners helps us do that. Mr. President, we're hoping to squeeze in at least one more Come question. On. Excellent, because I promised you earlier we have viewers out at sea. In fact, that's where Petty Officer Lori Bent is going to take us now. Fantastic. And what do you know, the sailor is going to take you out to sea for your next question, Mr. President. This is coming from the deployed USS Theodore Roosevelt. And on the phone, we have Petty Officer Joseph Everett. Petty Officer Everett, you are on the line. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Mr. President. I'm Petty Officer Joseph Everett calling you from the Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, I just want to thank you for uh, taking the time to talk to hey, me Joe? today. I'm very honored to have this Hold opportunity. Hold on, Joe. Uh, we're having trouble hearing you here. Slight technical difficulties. But if somebody else can hear, they can repeat the question to us. Petty Officer Everett, would you like to try that question again? Good afternoon, Mr. President. Um, this is Petty Officer Joseph Everett calling you from the Theodore Roosevelt. I just want to thank you for giving me this opportunity today, and I'm very honored. Well, I can hear you just fine now, Joe. And uh, tell, tell everybody on the ship uh, we appreciate them. Hope uh, they get back home safe. Uh, you got a question for us? Yes, Mr. President. During your presidency, you've had a lot of great experiences. What would you say is your most rewarding? That's, wow. That, well, that's a big question. Um, I, I tell you that uh, you know there, there are different kinds of rewarding experiences, obviously, in this in this office. Um, but but across the board, what ends up being most rewarding for me is when somebody comes up to me in a rope line when I'm appearing someplace or uh, at some event, and they say, uh, Mr. President, you helped me. Um, you know, I've had moms come up and say, uh, Mr. President, uh, you know, my son, who's you know, 25 years old, uh, didn't have health insurance. When you passed that law to make sure that he could stay on my health insurance, uh, he finally got a checkup after, you know, f three, four years. They found a tumor, but they were able to get it out in time, and now he's doing fine, and I appreciate it. Uh, or, you know, we have uh, White House tours of wounded warriors, and uh, once uh, this, this wonderful couple uh, was there, uh, both uh, the husband and wife were service members. They had two adorable little kids, uh, and as I was coining them and shaking their hands, uh, one of them said, uh, the, the wife said, uh, I just want to thank you because you saved our family because uh, the husband had had PTSD and, uh, but wasn't getting help, and uh, she had written to us, and, and uh, I had had uh, folks at DOD reach out, and he had gotten uh, counseling and now was doing well and the family was thriving. You know, it, a lot of times this stuff seems abstract. And, you know, uh, there's just a bunch of folks talking on television and it, it all seems like politics and um, arguing. Uh, but one of the things that you, you learn the longer you're, you're in this is that now, these decisions matter, and you're touching people directly in some kind of way. And, you know, when you hear that something you did actually helped, then you say to yourself, uh, all right, this was worth it. This, this was a good day. 
Um, and, and, and I know that everybody here feels that same way. Uh, you know, there are going to be frustrations in our work. Uh, there are going to be challenges in our work. Uh, many of you operate uh, in obscurity, uh, and people don't always say thank you. But then every once in a while, you see that, all right, what I did helped, made a difference. Somebody's safer. Somebody's, uh, you know, who was hungry is eaten. Uh, somebody whose home was destroyed, now they've got shelter. Uh, you know, somebody whose village had been overrun, now they've got a chance at uh, some security and some freedom. Um, and, and that's what keeps you going. Uh, that's, that's what uh, inspires you. So, um, so, so those are the most gratifying moments uh, of my presidency. Um, you know, uh, and the plane's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and Marine One. I don't want to leave the Marines out. Well, Mr. President, we know one of those challenges is that you do have other obligations and time constraints. So I want to thank you for part of the defense media activity, our soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen across the world, and the Coast Guard as we're representing the Coast Guard here as well. Thank you. And if you have any final remarks for us. Uh, I just want to say thank you to all of you uh, and to your family members uh, for your extraordinary service. Um, you know, what, what you do uh, is vital to our way of life. It is vital to our country. Uh, yeah, I started off talking about 9-11 and uh, how, uh, how shaken all of us were and angry and uh, frustrated and moved by it. But when you travel to New York now, you know, there's, there's a new tower soaring in the sky. And you know, those first responders, you know, the, the cops and the firemen and, and, and the EMTs, uh, a lot of them are still serving and still doing great work every day. And you know, it's just a good reminder of the essential uh, spirit of the American people. Um, you know, we don't always get things perfect the first time. Uh, there are times where we take a hit. Uh, there are times where, you know, unfortunately we have self-imposed uh, you know, problems because uh, of politics or conflicts uh, inside our own country. Uh, our, polit our political systems not always uh, serving people the way it should. Uh, one of the things that we haven't had a chance to talk about is the fact that Congress is, has a budget that is supposed to be passing at the end of this month, and we've been operating under uh, what's called a sequester, which is hampering our ability to finance the kind of readiness and uh, modernization and research and development and support for our troops that's needed. Uh, it's also preventing us from funding education and job training and infrastructure that is vital for our long-term economic competitiveness. I hope Congress is paying attention to how you operate and how you do your job, because if they were as conscientious about it and selfless about it, then that sequester would be lifted and we would end up being in a position where we could make the investments we need to stay strong militarily and economically. So, yeah, you know, we've got challenges, but just think about how we've bounced back from 9-11, from the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. Um, you know, America is the strongest, the most prosperous, and uh, the most diverse country on Earth. And you know, the 20th, 21st century is being shaped by our ideas of the internet and of uh, international trade and free markets. Uh, 
And, and the reason for all of that is because of our people. You know, sometimes you know, we hear about all the bad stuff that's going on, especially during political season. Uh, but America is strong, and it's strong because of all of you. And uh, I, I never want you to forget that. Uh, you should be very proud of what you do, uh, and uh, very proud uh, of you know, the people that you represent uh, in uniform every single day, because this country is full of good, generous, hardworking people, uh, and, uh, and, and they rely on you, and, and uh, they are grateful to you. All right? Tell your families I said hi back home. All right? Thank you, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, our Commander-in-Chief. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.